get rolling. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, great attendance. Uh, must start off by saying uh, great topic tonight that we've got, and it shows by the uh, attendance here. Unfortunately, I got some bad news, but hopefully I can make up for it. Is we did have two speakers tonight who unfortunately pulled out uh, kind of at last minute, uh, but uh, we do have a lot to go over anyway, and I will be getting into, I might not be getting into the IBM side, but I definitely will be getting into the Microsoft Azure and AWS side of things. So if you love Watson and IBM and you hate everything else, I guess you should go now, but it might be interesting to see what's on the other side of the fence anyway. So, um, and feel free to interrupt me at any stage. Um, probably have to take a lot of things on this topic offline. Uh, because it can get quite deep, uh, and it is one of those buzz topics that people skim over, but uh, I do want to try to uh, both give you guys uh, a business case for big data and analytics, real world examples, uh, not just a lot of spin and talk, uh, but also give you guys some uh, technical details as well, and we might even do a little bit of a uh, introduction to where things are on Amazon. So it, if you are a uh, Microsoft Azure fan, you'll probably be a bit uh, upset with how brief I go over things. Uh, but with the time that we've got, uh, like I said, it is a big topic. And uh, so I'm going to uh, probably be biased towards the AWS side. But in saying that, a lot of these things are crossover. A lot of the terms are just a little bit different or the way that you structure things is a little bit different. So I'm happy to talk to anybody offline about uh, anything that I go over, if I go over it too quickly, which I'm sure I will. So, just a quick agenda for tonight. So, uh, we've got an intro just introducing about Pug. Uh, sponsors, we'll uh, give a quick shout out to them. Uh, we'll do a cloud recap. So, it was really hard for me to put together a cloud recap because the last event that we had was in December. And so two months has gone past since then. A lot of announcements have happened. Uh, so I've tried to pick the best highlights from there, but uh, feel free to shout out if you think that I've missed something really obvious, because I'm sure I have. Uh, so, And then we'll get into some examples of big data and analytics, do a bit of a uh, AWS demo. Uh, I decided to cut out the Azure demo just for time and uh, some lightning talks and a bit about the community that's happening around locally. So, just about Pug, um, public cloud user group. Uh, we actually hit today 300 members. Uh, so, yep, a bit of a milestone. Uh, we're seeing around 50 new members a month. Uh, volunteers, happy to take yours. Help us out with the food, even finding speakers, qualified speakers, people like that. It doesn't even have to be here on the night. It can be helping out before the event or after the event online. Uh, the whole goal of this is to just educate, uh, help share what we know. Uh, get a, actually, I was listening to the radio on the way here, and they were talking about uh, where uh, the theory around people becoming geniuses. And I'm not trying to say that anybody here is Bill Gates or anything, but they were saying that it's not about uh, your genes as much as it is around the community that you're, uh, that you're in. So big city, uh, more population, they're finding that there seems to be more geniuses. I don't know how they determine if you're a genius or not. Uh, I mean, Einstein couldn't even type his shoelaces. So. But the idea, I think, is really that the more there's community, the more that they're sharing, the more that we're learning from each other, from our own mistakes, so we don't have to waste time uh, re-tripping over those mistakes, is really where our intelligence jumps way ahead. Uh, so I really feel like communities like this are really great for us advancing a lot quicker. Uh, I wish we could share this. Well, we can, actually. We're recording this, so we're sharing this with people outside of our community here. So hopefully they can contribute online as well and get the benefits that we are. Um, oh, and about that, sorry. Um, I don't endorse 
um, alcoholism or gambling. Somebody pointed that out to me. So, the gambling roulette is not a random thing. It wasn't like, oh wow, I'd love to have a bit of gambling. Let's, uh, let's do that. Because uh, I just, after here I get the shakes and I have to go off to a casino. No. Um, it was more around the fact that uh, big data and analytics, uh, a lot of my clients in gambling, online gambling, um, uh, this, this topic comes up all the time around capturing the information of people who are visiting their sites, what sort of bets they're making. I mean, even the betting itself uh, for the Super Bowl that's coming up, people are going to be betting on uh, the score. I mean, it's crazy these days. It used to be, when I was growing up, people were just betting on who won. But now it's about what, what the last digit is in the score or uh, who's the second try maker or how many field goals they might get in the game or something like that, or maybe it's, uh, I've even seen crazy ones where it's got to do with their uniforms and things like that, which really has nothing to do with the game at all. Well, not really the outcome of the game. So, yeah, that's, um, and I think that sort of evolution of all those sort of things that you could bet on has come about due to uh, the internet, big data, being able to crunch these numbers quicker, faster. So all these crazy ideas that somebody probably had in the 80s, like, hey, let's bet on this. Somebody probably shot it down and said, well, you've got no proof. You've got nothing to stand behind. You can't show me any real world data behind this. We'll probably lose our fleece on this because people are either not going to bet on it or we're going to lose out. So these sort of number crunching and things that can happen so quickly now and so cheaply, I think has opened up the door to more creative betting. Uh, that's just one example. Um, don't want to get into it too much, uh, but yeah, so I, I apologize if anybody's uh, going to lose their money tonight. I make a disclaimer that uh, that you can still gamble with some imaginary money, get it out of your system, just uh, feel like you've had a flutter and then, uh, then so we're helping, right Bobby? We're help, helping crush the addiction. And you, you can rent out this board anytime, I'll let you have it for free. <laughs> um, so yeah, and also uh, just... Just that community, if anybody has any lightning talks tonight, lightning talks are where uh, you might be doing something with the cloud or in the community uh, that you want to share with everybody else here tonight. Uh, feel free to jump up at the end, I'll uh, have a think about it while we're going through things tonight. Jump up at the end and uh, tell us what you're doing uh, with the cloud. Maybe it's your startup or maybe it's your startup idea that you're doing. Um, and then just uh, coffeecloud.net is where these uh, events, the videos, and the headlines from each month are uh, put up after each event. So, 2015, the stats. Uh, since we are looking at analytics and uh, number crunching, this, I didn't run through Hadoop or anything crazy. It was just uh, some figures I uh, quickly did on my uh, Windows calculator. Uh, but, uh, the average new members are seeing per month 50, uh, the largest RSVP for an event we had last month, 170, and uh, we did 13 events last last month, last year. So what are we going to see in 2016? I thought I'd just tease everybody with a few images that may seem irrelevant to IT. Uh, but yeah, we will be having a new Pug website, fresh uh, website, not based off Meetup. Uh, we're working on that at the moment. Um, there is going to be an event that involves a party bus during the year. Um, and then uh, we might not get Gordon Ramsay up for an event, but it may have that sort of uh, theme to it around kitchen, around the kitchen. And then uh, jackets. Uh, we may actually be launching a startup here at one of the events uh, as an exclusive thing that's happening uh, that they bundled around with their expected launch date. So some exciting things. Uh, as usual, we try to spice things up, make it a little bit interesting, and uh, not a death by PowerPoint. <laughs> um, in saying that, there are a lot of, well, there's not that many slides tonight. Um, so our sponsors, we've got a new Fendangle logo up there in the top corner, Dell. Um, as many of you may be aware, uh, Dell bought uh, last year EMC, uh, which also includes VMware. There's a lot of talk about them uh, selling off VMware. I, on the other hand, think that they may actually keep it. I mean, that's their foot, foot, door in, foot in the door. 
uh, to the cloud world. Um, and I actually think that Dell, I've, I've talked about this a lot, I think in the future cloud is going to become the accountant actually determining which cloud provider we use and the IT community is actually uh, going to be the ones that are actually just architecting and we don't care about the back of like, what it's actually running on. I think Dell is probably in a good position to do something like that, being uh, that they've also come from that background of uh, enabling the community to go online and purchase hardware from any vendor uh, without actually having to go out to stores and things like that. I think if they follow their roots there, maybe that might be the thing that they do here with cloud is be that broker, that middle person. They've already got some cloud tools that already go down this path. Uh, hopefully they don't just become very biased to VMware, uh, but hopefully the experience from VMware will set them up to tap into the market. Um, and then we've got Nutanix, which is hyper-converged hardware that also have a plug into the cloud. Trend Micro, uh, as you know, security is a big concern to everybody in the cloud. Uh, and they've got their uh, plugins to all the major cloud providers. Veeam for backup, and then uh, Coffee Cloud for, uh, for the news of uh, collection of what's happening here. Uh, just quickly, Soft Choice, where I'm from. Uh, just the whole swag of uh, logos here that I've just pumped on here. Uh, that makes us look pretty good around cloud. Hopefully, uh, if you have any projects or uh, want to even uh, just pick my brain about things. Uh, consulting work a lot of the time is non-billable, non which means you can uh, use me to uh, sound out any ideas you have or help you plan for the future, do some roadmaps and things like that around cloud. And finally, CodeCore, uh, letting us use this venue each month. Uh, They've been great supporters of the community, and uh, and yeah, if uh, anybody here is looking to get some training on uh, programming, I believe that's their niche, uh, this is the place to come, and uh, if you don't know who to talk to here, feel free to come to myself, and I'll put you in contact with Sam or one of the other people here. So this is, this is so normally I try to do more than Azure and AWS, tonight I am very biased towards the two. Uh, just in the scope of time, uh, but they did have a lot of announcements and it was very easy to find a lot of this information. Uh, compared to, I always complain, if, if somebody wants to help me with the other ones, software, Google, VMware and others, uh, it's very hard to capture their information, they don't have great blogs for seeing the latest updates and things like that, so uh, if anybody wants to help me out there, please uh, feel free to and even OpenStack and other, um, other pieces in the community as well. So, yeah, you'll notice both Azure and AWS have commented they both have both announced that they're coming to Canada this year. Uh, Microsoft's going to be in Toronto and Quebec, and uh, Amazon's going to be in Montreal. Uh, Microsoft's got a new store simple appliance. I'm so glad they finally did this because in all honesty, I think the store simple appliance, which is a hardware storage appliance that replicates the cloud, it was very expensive and uh, most people already have their storage already worked out. So this is actually a virtual appliance. Uh, Amazon has something very similar called Storage Gateway. Uh, and this appliance can be run in Azure or it can be run on premise on your own hypervisor. Uh, they also reduced uh, the D series, so the, the higher level in compute VMs uh, by 17%. Uh, they went GA, general availability, with their uh, Azure Site Recovery for VMware to Azure. So what that is, is um, the Site Recovery is sort of like a packaged up uh, backup and DR sort of tool that Microsoft had. And previously you had to install plugins and uh, you had to install servers up in Azure to get it working. Now it's actually kind of like a native uh, support, so you don't have to actually install anything extra there now. Um, they've also got their project Navy, um, which, is, which I probably pronounced wrong, but uh, it's WordPress running on Azure SQL. I thought this was uh, an important thing to point out because previously 
your choice was to go with MySQL, which is common, but it isn't natively supported for backups and other things in Azure. So you have to actually use a third party to manage your backups and things with Microsoft S uh, with MySQL. So now, um, now that they've got the Azure SQL, that's all going to be managed within the same console, which makes it easier because you're not going to get two bills and you're going to have one console to manage it all. Um, technical preview for the Azure stack. So this is, um, I keep calling this, this is Azure in a box version two. I keep joking about because uh, Microsoft likes to uh, name anything for on-premise as Azure. Uh, but then previously when we deep dived into it, it wasn't anything but a bundling of uh, different products. They've actually taken this a step further now. And uh, I think it's showing that uh, Microsoft's on-premise solutions now are actually, I mean, Azure used to be uh, built from the on-premise solutions. I think now you can see that things are flipping around. They're taking their Azure technology and putting it on-premise. So the new server OS that's coming out and things like that, it's all designed for cloud. And the new Azure that's coming to Canada, they're actually not, what they used to have is Azure and they had Office 365 as two separate uh, sort of data center setups. Now they're actually merging them together, they're putting Office 365 on top of Azure. Uh, and I think this is an example here of them now taking the Azure technology. It's been already baked into the on-premise technology that they're bringing, bringing out, so you can use now the same tools. And now you'll, you'll be able to start using the Azure online console that you use to manage your cloud to manage your on-premise as well. So this is, this is something I actually heard from Amazon as well. They're actually thinking of just going down this path as well. But obviously, Microsoft has the bigger advantage of actually having their own operating system and a lot more pieces that they've been building towards this for a long time. So it's not something that somebody could do overnight and it's something that's a bit of a journey, but it does make the hybrid cloud story a lot easier. Um, and as you can see there, this makes me some quick snippets that the API is the same for on-premise and Azure. Uh, the management tools and automation tools are the same. You can use either or. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, resource manager. You, if you jump into the world of Azure, you'll start to hear more and more about resource manager, which is a bit like cloud formation in AWS and uh, uh, really helps you manage and template your environment on Azure. Uh, and just lastly around Azure is Azure Explorer update. It now supports Linux. So this is a tool that you can install on your now Linux, uh, Windows, and OS X uh, to actually dig into your storage, your blob storage on Azure. So you can actually jump in there and uh, dig around. Uh, blob storage on Azure, I feel like I'm translating the whole time. Huh? On AWS, it's the equivalent of S3 storage. So it'd be like an S3 Explorer. Uh, Amazon, uh, we already jumped onto about Amazon opening up in Canada. They're also opening up in Iowa, India, and the UK. Um, workspaces, nobody knows about workspaces. It's uh, BDI as a service, as I would refer to it. Um, and now they're going to actually support audio in, which I only found out last year wasn't supported, and I was surprised. Uh, so audio in is now supported, as well as um, high DPI screen support, which I had to look up. I wasn't sure what that was, but uh, I believe it's around, they made reference to the Surface tablet and uh, other new tablets, and I think it's around actually noticing your screen resolution, the DPIs and all those sort of things, and making sure that your experience from that virtual desktop is the same as the quality of your uh, video card that's running on your um, on your tablet or your PC or something like that. So you're not actually being crippled uh, by the drivers that are up there in the cloud. You're actually being able to leverage what your local hardware can do. Uh, there's probably a bit more to it than that. And then saved reg is uh, if you're using multiple workspaces, uh, I haven't come across this with any clients yet, uh, so I actually was this, uh, but I can understand that uh, you put your code in, you're saying which uh, workspace you want to uh, connect to, 
Well, it'd be very annoying if you've got multiple workspaces and you've got to retype that in or copy and paste in a different one each time. So now it'll save it and obviously it'll have a drop down box or something for you to click between the two workspaces if, you, if you're working on multiple ones. Maybe that might work if you're in a test dev environment or something. You've got test dev desktops that maybe you want to try out things and things like that or you're an administrator deploying out workspaces to several people. Uh, scheduling for auto scale. This is actually a great one. I actually had talking about gambling. Uh, I had a client the other day that said we're going to get hit hard for the Super Bowl. We're going to have everybody jumping onto our site uh, to to look at content around the Super Bowl. Uh, and when there's bathroom breaks during the Super Bowl, we're going to get hit even harder. Uh, but outside of that, we want to control the auto scale. So this I haven't looked into it too much yet, uh, but. It sounds like this would be a perfect fit for them and maybe other situations as well where you can actually uh, change the auto scaling based on a schedule. Uh, AWS Internet of Things, as you might know, AWS has their own uh, area in their portal around the Internet of Things. Uh, now supports web sockets and uh, keep alive intervals, which means you can ping your uh, devices out there by uh, custom times now. Uh, EMR, obviously, with tonight's topic, I thought this was interesting just to tell you guys the versions. Uh, I'm not that nerdy into uh, Hadoop and Spark and that to have memorized the version numbers, but many of you might be like, oh yeah, that version wasn't good. Okay. So, um, and code pipeline now can trigger Lambda. I know I had two events last year where I kept saying that word wrong. Um, so that's great. Uh, I think the more that uh, Lambda gets built into in AWS, the better. Um, AWS Certificate Manager, you may not have heard this, came out in December uh, to manage your SSL certificates and things like that. Uh, and then, uh, so Amazon's also released a new service called SDS, Simple Drone Service. Uh, so, I, I can't remember, I think I read this back in December, so I'm a bit hazy on this now, but I think they're doing APIs and things uh, around controlling drones. Uh, I thought it was a joke at first, but the article went into quite some depth, so I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it, but obviously there's a pun on the actual uh, simple storage service, S3. Excuse me. So. Let's talk about some stories with uh, big data and analytics. So I was reading about Riot Games, and uh, I thought this was a good quote from an article I was reading about them. Uh, they were saying, Riot Games, uh, that they're data informed rather than data driven. Uh, they always incorporate data into their decision making process, but never allow the data to dictate decisions. I think that's a good point, is that with big data, uh, I mean, what it really means is lots of different uh, pieces of information. Um, I know when I used to be a <coughs> manager back in a uh, company back in Australia, uh, the KPIs that we used to set, uh, key performance index for our staff, we were collecting a lot of metrics around our help desk portal and. Uh, uh, pieces like uh, how long had a ticket been sitting there for. Now we had all this information, but the most important thing that we got out of it was working out what was what was relevant and what what was uh, going to blindside us if we were if we were setting our staff. And we we learnt some hard lessons sometimes where we would say to the staff, "Look, we want you to hit these metrics. We want you to get this." And then all of a sudden our customer satisfaction would go down and it was because we were driving something too hard or we were driving it the wrong way and we were just looking at the numbers sometimes. And that's the hard thing with, uh, depending on what your outcome is, you've got to be really careful that you're not getting too deep in the weeds and just letting the data. Sometimes I've seen it where people go, hey, uh, Microsoft now lets us in SharePoint, for instance, collect these pieces of information. We should do that. that That'll be awesome, it'll make a great graph, but they're forgetting about why would you even do this? What, what's gonna be the outcome? What, what's gonna drive? So I think it's better to start it from the other side of things to say, where do I wanna go? What, what do I wanna capture? 
then go to the technology and say, can we get this today? If we can't, then okay, we've got to work out some other metrics to look at. Uh, but this is the end goal that we want to get to. Uh, instead of just looking at the technology and saying, this is, this is cool, this API is new, we can get this data now, now why do we want that? Uh, I think that's the wrong way, and that's really what they were getting to here, is around, it's kind of that old story of, don't just do it because you can, uh, do it because you, you, need you need that information, it'll add value and cut down and uh, put, put, some, uh, put some business drivers and some thoughts into, uh, why you're even looking at this in the first place. I mean, if you're not, if you're collecting all this information and you're not um, driving the right results, then it could actually be worse for you in the long run than actually uh, not looking at the data at all. Here we go. Uh, give me a heart attack. I have not been having a good time with my new surface tablet. Okay, so, um, Boston. So the city of Boston had a really good story about uh, a new app that they brought out. They wanted to find, so they, they did approach this the right way. They said, right, what do we want to do? We want to find potholes in the city. We want to fill those potholes and we want to make sure that we're capturing uh, where those potholes are quickly and getting onto it. Because obviously, previous to that, like most cities, they have to wait for somebody to call up, report a pothole, and then process it that way. Uh, this way, they wanted to be proactive. They wanted to be capturing this information automatically. They didn't want people to have to jump onto their cell phone either and go into the app and do anything messy like that and do a GPS coordinate or anything. So what they actually did, they created a great app that would actually notice tremors in your car while you were driving. So you'd be driving along, you'd go over a bump, and, um, and it would send a signal off to say, hey, this GPS coordinate where this phone was, there's a pothole most likely there. And then the next 10 cars do the same thing in that same spot. They go, okay, it wasn't a dead body, it was actually a pothole. <laughs> and it's been there for the last two days, and so we're going to send somebody out. What they actually found, though, was although it was doing a great job, it was only picking up this information in the wealthy areas. So this is where um, algorithm bias comes in, is where you might be capturing the data correctly, you might actually be act like, they're making those wealthy people uh, fantastically happy, but what they hadn't counted on the fact was that the wealthy people are the ones with smartphones. They're the ones that have the time to actually find out about things that probably don't concern somebody on the poverty line is potholes because they don't have a car or they don't, uh, or they're, they're struggling to actually find, uh, they probably would rather find out where the cheapest gas price is so that they can drive their car uh, further rather than where the potholes are. So it's kind of one of those first world problems sort of things uh, where it's all relevant to who. So that's what they found and so obviously they were being biased then to looking after the wealthy areas and not looking after the other areas. And if that had continued without them noticing that, obviously they would have had um, a lot of backlash because their services would have got diverted to these other areas and uh, the poorer communities would have got neglected. So that's that, that's, that's another story around, yes, you can collect your data, yes, you can have a good vision and know exactly what you want to collect and the outcomes that you want, but being aware of anything that may cause bias in the results there. So let's get on to how this looks in Microsoft Azure. So, and I am just scraping the surface on the Azure. Um, but, so Azure Data Lake uh, is really their whole concept around big data and analytics. Uh, putting this diagram here just to illustrate how a lot of this works, and you can see here that it really is a hybrid world. They're talking about the on-premise where your data's get coming from. Um, they've got 
SQL data warehouses, which you can also aggregate the SQL databases. So instead of having lots of individual databases where you're actually, so I spin up one database, Microsoft says, okay, there are some core components here that I've also got to do. And when you spin up another separate SQL database, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of pieces that are identical, such as the operating system and the, uh, uh, a lot, before you even get up to the data level, there's a lot of things that are exactly the same and replicated. Now, if you aggregate those things, those databases, you can actually save a lot of money. Uh, so they've actually got that option. That, that's actually a new feature that they brought out last year, being able to aggregate those databases to save money. Uh, so it's under the one cluster. So we've got multiple databases under the one cluster. Uh, and also, I mean, it would make the management easier as well. Um, and then we've got uh, the data factory and machine learning. So the whole idea here is that um, there is Hadoop mentioned here. Hadoop is probably the biggest uh, there with the data factory, but it does support other um, tools there with big data. But then that gets pumped out to their uh, machine learning. So they've got machine learning as a service there which you can actually orchestrate and uh, manage what you're actually uh, learning and, and pumping out outcomes there for. Like I said, it was brief. Uh, by the way, I think Terence is still around, so if afterwards you want to find out even more deep dive on that, uh, Terence is our Microsoft SA. Uh, who knows this stuff like the back of his hand compared to me. So um, I should sit down with him and get him to teach me more. But uh, he's always off snowboarding up crazy mountains. Uh, okay, so Amazon. So what I'm trying to do here is try to uh, show sort of like the path you would take on Amazon to do big data and analytics. So it's sort of a story where we're going to start off by collecting the information. Uh, so, Snowball is a new service that Amazon brought out. We're talking about petabytes of information. Uh, if you've already got it on premise, th that's a lot of information to get up there. There are these other services, Direct Connect, where you can have a direct internet connection straight to Amazon's data center, uh, which is obviously going to cut latency and get you a better quality connection to their service. Uh, they do have their import-export service, plus there might be other tools that you've got that are uh, brokering the exchange between your on-premise or other area by other data centers to Amazon. Or you may even be collecting the information in Amazon itself. But if it's outside, Snowball is actually this uh, nifty little device. I think it's about yay big, like from the table here, not from the ground. Um, rock solid, you're supposed to be able to drop it from whatever, when I saw a demo of it, I asked the guy to drop it, he wouldn't. Um, I, I guess it was new, so he didn't want to test it out, he only had one demo of it. Uh, but it has a nice little um, Kindle e-ink uh, interface at the front. Um, and the idea is that they send it out to you, I think it's like two weeks that you have it for. You can plug it into your uh, data center, uh, throw all your data onto it, and then when you're done, I think there's like a button you press and then you slide the screen down and it locks in. There's a barcode and uh, everything's there. Courier comes out, scans that barcode, takes it back to Amazon. And uh, it, yeah, I think it holds about, actually I should have looked it up, about 50 terabytes per, uh, per device. So the idea is that you can, uh, 50 terabytes, yeah. Uh, don't quote me on that, it could be 500, it could be 50. <laughs> It is 50? Oh, yeah. It sounded familiar, but I, I hate it when I say things off the top of my head and then people correct me later. So, uh, 50, okay, you've heard it. Uh, if anybody's upset later on, it wasn't me that verified that. <laughs> um, so, we take that, we've got our information up there. Where do we want to store it? So, we've got S3 and EBS. So, S3, as many know, probably, which is how Amazon started, is their... Uh, uh, simple storage, uh, very cost effective, three cents per gig. Or EBS volumes, which are uh, storage volumes that you attach to your servers that operate just like a normal uh, drive that you would have attached to your 
uh, operating system Linux or Windows Server VM. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward where we score it. Um, but then what we want to do is we, we want to actually start doing the number crunching. So we've got uh, no SQL services like DynamoDB where we can get that information in very quickly. But you don't have to, I mean, NoSQL is something that everybody thinks of when they think of big data and analytics. But there is also RDS with Postgres, MySQL, Aurora, um, and, and the others. And um, so you can use your traditional databases as well. Uh, and then finally, Redshift for your big data warehouse uh, storage. Uh, so that's the idea of just uh, getting your information in there quickly and just paying for the time that it's actually being processed. Uh, then we want to analyse it, so we want to actually take that information that comes out. It's all well and good to do that number crunching and come back with uh, some actual integers or, uh, or values that have popped out. But what do we do with that afterwards? So then we can analyse it. So uh, there's uh, Amazon's Elastic Map Reduce, uh, basically Hadoop, uh, that we can do that uh, analysis with. And then finally, once we've got those results, because a lot of these services here, especially here in the middle, the, uh, the real guts of the big data and analytics, won't actually store the information for you. So you've got to then dump it somewhere afterwards. So that's where somewhere like uh, storage like Glacier, so you could get your results out and then you could store them long term. So for one cent a gig, that sort of thing, uh, a lot of the time, most people only need this information the second it pops out of Hadoop. Uh, but you want to hold on to it just in case you want to rerun those numbers again or for historical reasons, you might want to crunch it against that 12 months later. So you can hold that information in Glacier and run it later. So let's do a quick demo. So like I said, I'm just going to do a um, sort of a very, very brief introduction with the time that we have left. Uh, and just show you guys how easy it is to get into this stuff in AWS. Um, I am very surprised. I, you probably noticed I haven't been wandering around tonight. There's a lot of cables on the floor here. So <laughs> I've uh, been half expecting to trip over all night. So let me just uh, jump out of this. Mirror Actually, it is. It is my car. Uh, maybe not that exact one. But very similar. Four hundred fifty. But that's only. Haven't haven't tried that out yet. <laughs> so. Okay, we got that replicated. Let's jump into Amazon. So as you can see, if nobody's ever seen the Amazon console before, there are a lot of services here. Um, to save me looking like an idiot and trying to find which one I'm looking for, I have actually done a shortcut up the top um, to actually help me find these things quickly that I wanted to go over. So we've got the import-export tool for Snowball. So the idea here is basically go here and we sign up. So this is going to give us a form that says what's our address, how many of them do we want, um, and then they're going to ship them out to us. We're going to have that two week window to get them back to them. Uh, I believe there's like a $30 fee or some, some, some fee for every day over that you don't get it back by. Um, but the idea is just Amazon doing what they do well is they're first line of business being a uh, shipping of goods. Uh, so they're going to get that out to you quickly. You're going to plug that in, you're going to get your data up there into the cloud. Then we're going to run EMR, so the Elastic Map Reduce. And this is where we're going to start uh, processing things. So we're doing the upload process. We're uploading using Snowball as the hypothetical example. We're going to store that data in S3, their simple storage service. Um, then we're actually going to move across and we're going to create a Hadoop cluster and we're going to start uh, 
processing that data that we've got stored in S3. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, built into this console, we're going to have monitoring to see the health and progress of what's coming from that. And then the output is uh, going to go into the S3. Now, Redshift, so again, just, just to let you know, I'm not doing anything fancy here when I jump into these things. Um, these sh are just shortcuts up the top. You can find them yourself by going to the home page. You just have to filter through the uh, 40 or 50 other services there. Uh, but Redshift, obviously here, it's about uh, data warehousing. So the idea here is that we're gonna create clusters um, in Redshift to let us uh, build these clusters and then pump the data through there. So again, this, this as I was talking about earlier, is not somewhere where you, you would want to store information. Uh, the idea is once it comes out, we're going to store it in somewhere like S3 or Glacier. Uh, but the idea is that you're going to pay, um, I believe from memory, the pricing plans on this is uh, you're paying by the storage that you pump through it and also the hours. Uh, or it may just be the hours that, you, that you're processing through. So, uh, Redshift is something that you can actually test out. Uh, I think they have it on their free tier. So Amazon have certain services that you can try out for free. Uh, their smallest instance server you can run for a whole year. Uh, S3, I think you get five gigs of free storage. Uh, Redshift, you get something around 700 hours free or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of these, uh, Snowball you don't, um, EMR, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if EMR's on their free tier list, but at least there are some, uh, pretty substantial services there that you can actually try out. Uh, a lot of the time there's enough there to do a test workload, uh, without incurring any sort of expense. Uh, and the only time I ever see any sort of expense on the free tiers when you're trying stuff out as a proof of concept is usually when you're bringing the data back out. So if you wanted to download the results uh, to your on-premise, but hopefully you've done the big number crunching. So all that big data that you're putting into there uh, from maybe your on-premise that might be terabytes of information, that's all free. Everything that's going into Amazon, that traffic is free. It's when you're pulling it back out again. But my theory is, you're going in with big data, pushing that in there for free, and then what you're getting out is just your finite results. So you've basically compressed all that data just down to what you particularly want to know. Anything else you might store up there uh, is still going to be uh, pretty cost effective if you're storing it in Glacier or rerun at a later date, you're talking about one cent a gig. Uh, I mean, it's all relative to what your value is, but uh, one cent a gig in today's uh, uh, times when storage is at a premium a lot of the time and the cloud is changing that, uh, it's pretty good to, in that you don't have to have these services. That's the other thing to point out is uh, uh, Elastic MapReduce, Redshift, and these other services, when you're not using them, you're not paying for them. So once your processing finishes, you've stored it in S3 or Glacier, you're no longer paying for that anymore. It's, uh, it's only while you're using it, you, you crunch those numbers, you get that through, you get the results, then you're just paying for the three cents or one cent a gig to store those results or the traffic for you to download those results back down to your on-premise to pump it into whatever report or, uh, or tools that you have that you want to use for. So that was, like I said, a brief, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So did anybody have any questions? Like I said, I'm just trying to do a very introduction course. If there is interest in doing a deep dive or a level two or level three, let me know. Um, we actually, and, and I'll definitely, uh, I'll bound and gag speakers about this event in uh, future to make sure they actually do come out. Uh, but this actually came around this topic due to the voting on the polls of our uh, meetup group. So uh, if you want to see this one again, make sure you vote for it. Uh, and let me know if you want to get deeper diving in the future. So. Uh, 
just briefly on lightning talks. So, um, anybody has any lightning talks, feel free to come up now while you're getting your Dutch courage. Um, I'll just point out some things that are happening in the community. Um, so, there is a... Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the word because I'll probably get it wrong. But an event happening in Seattle next week. Um, all around jumping in there and uh, trying out your code and, uh, and networking with other people to uh, sort of workshop your code that you might be working on. Um, there is a discount code there, this 100. I'm not sure if this code still works, it's a little old now, but uh, give it a crack if you're interested. Um, and then Jeff, who frequents his, this event a lot, but it's not here tonight. Uh, he would have yelled out by now. Um, he has his own podcast now. I think he said they're on their 10th episode or something. It's a weekly podcast where they cover what's happening in the tech community in Vancouver. Uh, so they've had some great people on the show to uh, talk, uh, people from community businesses and startups around. Uh, so check that out. Uh, I think it's vancouvertechpodcast.ca. Just rolls off the tongue. It's not, not, not nice to read, but... Uh, easy to say. Yeah. yeah, sure. Actually, I didn't really give a pause for anybody to jump up, did I? Does anyone want to do any talks? Oh, yeah, talks wise. I'm going to, I meant to do this in December. I'm going to email out everybody that had listed their net as interested in talking uh, at an event. Uh, I think we've got about 30 or 40 people that have said that they're very interested in talking. But. If you want to remind me, uh, or I'll take that as you're very keen and you want to jump up even quicker than December. Um, so feel free to email me, reach out, let me know. Uh, let me know also because what I'm going to be doing is emailing everybody that has let me know that they want to do talks and just find out what you actually want to talk about, what level it's going to be at. And because we actually have a roadmap for the whole year of all the topics that we want to do. but will work you into whatever topics we have, or if I think it's a great topic, or the community thinks it's a great topic, we'll, we'll scrub out what we were going to do for that month and, uh, and get you up and talking about that topic as well. And maybe even we might find that there's more interest than we thought on that particular topic. Yeah. Is this good? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Bob with Soft Choice, and I just, um, something you said earlier that I thought I'd share, and I don't mind people correcting me. I may not have it exactly right, but I was at the Dell events uh, a while back on, on Big Data, BI, whatever you want to call it. And it kind of reminded me, like when I was in university, there was an extremely good professor I had in, in statistics, uh, management science, business school. Smartest guy like I've ever met. And at the time, it was the early 90s, and they couldn't get the data. Like, you would say, well, you know, if you, you can get these companies to pull the data, give it all to us, we can make excellent business decisions. But at the time, like who's gonna, you might have a Canadian company that does that. But when I went to the Dell event, they have um, basically a bunch of products that they can do. But these days, they can actually not just have the data reside in a central place, they can go out to where the data is and, and grab it there. They don't have to actually all this complicated stuff even with IT to get the data. So then you have all this data, and you can imagine a company that maybe has been around for 100 years has never looked at this data. So it can really add to innovation. So the example they had, which I thought was kind of cool, is an oven maker. I don't know if you stayed long enough for this, but the restaurant ovens. Sounds really boring, right? But anyway, they had the best restaurant oven in the world. But they were getting competition from like the usual suspects, China, and it was starting to eat in their margins, so they had the best quality oven. So they pulled all the data, and they'd done analysis on it, and by doing that, they determined that they, if they put Internet of Things on their ovens to measure certain temperatures and certain things, they could optimize the ovens at any point in time. And so they could make the best french fries or whatever it was, right? So what by doing this, this company got rid of the competition um, because it was very hard to copy, because that's when you go in business, you know. If you can make it, someone can copy it. But if it's harder to copy, like what they had done, uh, they were able to keep up their margins and things like that. So I thought it was a really good example 
of, of what this can pull out for certain companies. And I think Dell's particular product would be, there's a whole bunch of them, and this is kind of interesting to you, but they have Statistico, which is a Dell product. So think of that professor I was talking about. The professors, they have him do it. The professors have created this product called Statistico, so now you can put this information in, and I think of the information two ways. You put the information in and, and, and you don't have any conceived ideas about what's going to come out, and you realize certain things correlate to each other that you'd never, ever thought of. Or certain of you probably had ideas that you thought were really good ideas, but what if you could go validate that the data actually supports that idea? So I just thought it was really interesting that Bell, Bell event brought up some of those ideas. So. You know, actually, you remind me, I was there for that. I think it's a good example where, uh, I think when big data and analytics comes up as a topic, people think, oh, that's for the enterprises. And these guys weren't like a big enterprise. They were, they were selling um, selling quality ovens, and uh, they just found that against everybody else, they just weren't standing out anymore. They do top quality ovens, but it, so, yeah, they used the, uh, the data that they were collecting uh, to, and I think that comes back to me, what I was talking about earlier is, um, have an outcome that you want to achieve and then use that data to get that uh, evidence and information. Um, the, the thing I hate hearing all the time, being a cloud architect, is people saying, okay, we want to talk to you because our boss has said cloud first, and we're gonna do cloud. But I, my first question is why? What, what are your drivers? What's, what's bringing you to cloud? And they go, uh, cost. And you know that it's just because that's the buzz thing that they've heard. They haven't actually thought about it. They haven't actually said cost. Maybe, maybe cost isn't even really important to their business uh, if they can justify the value. But big data and analytics is another one. It's a, like I said at the start, it's like one of those buzz things that you hear a lot. And it could be something at your business or something where your boss is saying to you, look, we're gonna do this big data analytics or we're doing this internet of things. Like, I don't know why, but everybody's talking about, we gotta jump on this. The first question you should be saying is, why? What, what are our drivers? What do we wanna achieve from this? Uh, maybe there is a good case and maybe it's something, it's good that they're raising it. Maybe it's good that they're bringing it up, but just make sure that you're not following down that path blindly to just say, Oh, because everybody else is doing it. So, just quickly about the next event. So, the next one, I'm actually uh, away for March, going back to down under Australia. So, uh, first time in three years, so uh, I'm sure it's changed a lot. I've probably gone back to horse and buggy. Um, but, we do have an exciting event in April that uh, looks like a uh, we've got a speaker from Stripe. We're just working out what the topic will be on with the cloud. Uh, so that'll be an exciting one. Um, and I'll make sure that they turn up. And uh, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to carry, what, do, I, do I carry um, a taser or some candy? <laughs> Actually, that's it. That's what I probably should have done. I should have said to the IBM and Microsoft guys, hey, there's beta here. Like, Oh, the pizza, and there's uh, roulette. So, um, so anyway, just one last final thing uh, is just there is a, a website competition at the moment. So as I said, we're building a website for pubgroup.com. Uh, so we're not going to uh, we're, we're going to tap into the API of Meetup, but we're going to have our own polished independent site. Uh, and so what we're doing at the moment is on freelancer.com. Uh, we've got a competition up there at the moment. Uh, $200 prize. The prize isn't such a big deal uh, as in whoever, we're, we're more looking for this to find out who will build the site after uh, we award the prize. So I, I felt like instead of people sending me their resumes and examples of websites that they built in the past, which I don't even know if they have built or not, we put out a prize and a competition where people shape their examples of work to Pug, so I know it's their work, and I know that it's quality, and that they're not just grabbing a Word template, uh, WordPress template and throwing it up there. 
So in saying that, a lot of them are just grabbing WordPress templates and just throwing it up there and putting code groups. So. Was that not a requirement? What's that? To use only WordPress? It was to use WordPress, uh, but a lot of them are not even trying, I would say. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, they're, they're just grabbing a nice looking template and not even putting the word pug group on the template or anything. Uh, so I would say that if you're interested, if you're into web design and that, put an entry in because at the moment it'd be a pretty easy win. Um, I actually put a shout out to all the people that were entering. I pointed them to my uh, kissmyaws.com site, which I built in two hours. And uh, so hopefully they don't all go and just copy my, uh, my site and just say, there you go, just looks a little different there. But, um, but yeah, it, hopefully we get some creative entries there. I just want to do a shout out tonight to get the interest in the community here. If you know someone who'd be interested in winning an easy $200, um, get them to put in an entry because I'd rather work with someone locally here and, uh, and get, get something built for the local community from uh, by the local community. So. Anyway, uh, that's... Oh, just a quick shout out to the soft choice guys that were bringing the beer and pizza and uh, didn't know how to organize a roulette party. Sorry, man. <laughs> uh, we, we all learn. Uh, we're obviously not gamblers here. Uh, New poker. Next oh, time. Okay, okay. Bring the deck of cards. So, yeah. Thank you very much for attending, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you all back here in April.